came up with. So he's a physicist by training and he's doing evolutionary biology. Uh, so welcome and please start. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for the organizers inviting me, giving me opportunity to present here. It's quite exciting talking among all these very important and famous people. So uh, I chose quite a general title, like the population genetics of intertumor heterogeneity. And some of it, all of you might know, some of it might be new. And it's definitely not a solved problem. So many, many, many questions are open and uh, we have worked on in the moment or uh, try to work on in the future. So. I guess in science in general, you can have like two general perspectives of how to do things. You either collect a lot of data and then try to make sense of it in terms of finding some interpretation of what you actually see. Or you try to start with some theory based on certain assumptions or prepositions and then try to deduce certain things, how they should look like, and then you try to find these patterns in the data. Of course, they're not mutually exclusive and both of them are extremely important. Uh, I try to come from the second perspective a bit, so presenting some theory first and try to see how it looks like in the data. So because I don't know if I come to the end, I want to start with this one. So uh, people I collaborate with, so not all of these people collaborated in the work I present here. So the people in dark are the most important one for, for the things I present here. So Andrea, whom I work with in London, and Trevor and Mark, and Chris as well. So because we heard so many talks about intertumor heterogeneity, evolution, and genetics, so I don't need to give you a long introduction of what I'm talking about. You have heard that for the last two and a half days, I think, just very briefly. If we talk about intratumor heterogeneity, what we mean is if we take parts of the tumor, chunks, usually bulks, and we sequence them, we find tons and tons of mutations. And they differ, so some mutations are shared between some of the sites in the tumor. Some of them are unique to certain sites of the tumor, and within each of these samples, we find a lot of mutations there. So, we kind of want to make some, some theoretical sense of these patterns that we, that we see here. And because I said I want to, want to more start from a theoretical perspective, there are just very simple assumptions that we start with and then want to see how, how far they bring us in describing what we, what we observe. So we, we could say, I mean, I guess everyone here agrees that cancer is caused and driven by a somatic evolutionary process. I'll try to specify later what it means. Uh, and when we, when we observe data, it just means that we, that we basically measure the manifestation of this process at a certain time in the evolutionary history of the tumor. When we, when we take the tumor out, it doesn't mean that the evolutionary process stopped there, it's just we measured at that time, which is somewhat arbitrary to, to a certain degree. And it's somewhat obvious that evolution, of course, is a dynamic process. So evolution only can happen over time. So if there's no time, there's no evolution. So I would argue that in the end, to describe all these patterns that we observe, we would also need a dynamic theory that can not only describe the patterns we see, but also explains how these patterns actually arose in time during the evolutionary process of the tumor. But before we go actually to cancer, I wanted to start with a slightly historic perspective because it's somewhat interesting and it fits in what we talk about. So, Experimental evolution is not a new concept. It's not like five years ago, people came up with like, ah, oh, let's do evolution, experimental evolution. Long, long time ago, people did experimental evolution. So in the 1920s and 30s, for example, people did experimental evolution on bacteria and phages. So they grow bacteria in the petri dish, they put phages, the bacteria dies, but they observe after a certain time, this bacteria adapted and doesn't die anymore under the presence of the phage. So at that time, one, so obviously is resistant. So at that time, the important question was, is this resistance pre-existing? So does it exist already in the population of the bacteria, or is it a plastic response to the exposure to the bacteria? So that's what people at that time were interested in. And surprisingly, the answer, which is beautiful, was found in 1943, so a long, long time ago. And we still think that's a very important question in cancer today. And how they found it? Uh, is this, uh, it's called the fluctuation test, or the famous lura delbrück experiment, and what they actually did, the idea is quite simple, but it's very beautiful. So they, they grow a lot of bacteria in a petri dish, then they separate them in different, in different populations, grow them again for a while, and after a while they expose them to the phage. And if you have these two, two competing uh, hypotheses, pre-existing or plastic, uh, you would see that uh, if you do that in many, many, many of these petri dishes, you would get a different distribution of resistance. If it's pre-existing, 
you will find many of these petri dishes that are not resistant at all because you just sample a small population and there's a small chance that you sample this pre-existing population. But if this is resistant, then most of the petri dish should be resistant. If it's plastic, you would assume it's much more equally distributed among these dishes. So this is in birds what, what, what they observed. And then you can do some theory and you can actually calculate these distributions how they should look like and you can measure that and you can com compare to these distributions. And what they found, I said in 1943, it much better fits to the hypothesis of pre-existing resistance. And it was the first time this was shown. And I think that's kind of amazing because they didn't know the mechanisms. They didn't even know the structure of DNA or mutations or anything else, but they could show just on this very simple hypothesis. So, so spontaneous, in terms of cancer, for example, you think of just random mutations going on. So you have diversity within your population. You have billions and billions of bacteria in your petri dish, like a huge population size. And they didn't know that at the time, but uh, when you draw these population sizes, you accumulate mutations. And when you put the phages, you select for certain bacteria that just have by chance a mutation that makes them resistance to this, to this phage, for example. Plastic would be there's some, the bacteria notices that there is some phage and they act, activate some defense mechanism that they may have acquired like in ancient history against, against these phages. Uh, so whatever this mechanism would be, I'm not a biologist, I don't know. Anyhow, they found that is, that is uh, stochastic in a sense. So it's pre-existing diversity in your population of bacteria that you simply select for. Yeah, you select, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. You select on standing variation. Yes, yes, yes. And that's what they find. So that's the explanation for this type of data. Long before you'd know DNA and mutation and anything. So it's quite... Yes, so the distribution, if you look at the distribution, if you look at the variance of the distribution, it's more stochastic. Yes, it's less, less equally distributed amongst these petri dishes, yes. So then you can, I mean, I don't show it enough here. You can calculate how that should look like and stuff like that. The only thing I present that is because it turns out also, it's a very old question that the math behind all these things that people work on since 50 years is very similar to certain problems we have in cancer. So I should have showed that the accumulation of mutations and standing variation diversity within tumors follows very, like, very much, not exactly, but very much of what is observed in these experiments. So I said, okay, we want to have dynamic models. So start with a very simple one. As I said, I'm a physicist, so I draw very simple pictures. Uh, what is the evolutionary history of a tumor? So we start with a single cell, so this single cell in some way accumulated all these mutations that are necessary for the tumor to become malignant. So we're not talking about like what happened in this pre-cancer stage, but we, we assume we had a stage where that happened. And now, so this is a set of mutations, this blue can be 10 mutations, 100 mutations, 1,000 mutations, I don't care. And now this tumor starts to expand, so it divides into two cells, and it divides into four cells, and in this process, these cells accumulate mutations. So that diversify within the tumor if you want. And then we do what we do and we say, okay, we start with this very simple tumor because we can understand what happened here. So our tumor just consists of these four cells and these four cells carry certain mutations. And then we do what like many, many people here talked about before. We take the tumor out and we sequence the tumor. So we see what mutations are there and at what frequency are these mutations. So we construct the side frequency spectrum. And in this case, of course, the side frequency spectrum looks very, sim uh, very simple. And I do some simplifications. There's no noise here and stuff like that. So the side frequency spectrum here would be, I have some clonal mutations. These are these blue mutations. They have all of the cells. And then I find subclonal mutations because they're just a fraction of these cells. And depending on population size and when, when they occurred, they shift to lower and lower frequencies. So I have some at 0.5. Uh, 0.25 and so on. So if you continue this process, you would get more and more mutations at lower and lower frequency. So we already have an expectation what the theory says. If we sequence tumors, we should find more and more mutations at lower and lower frequency. So that's one prediction, but we can make it more quantitative, of course. Yeah, and of course we call this clone and subclone, like what you heard many times before. But we can take it, make it more quantitative. So I choose to show some math because I think it's good to to see certain things, but uh, don't need to understand everything in detail. But a more modern way of how to describe these things, but it's still a description of the lear delbert experiment, but also of this mutation accumulation is writing down what we call a master equation. A master equation sounds very scary, but it just means what's the change of the probability of a certain state? How does that change over time? 
my population. And here we ask, capital N is the number of cells in my tumor, and I increase my tumor from N cells to N plus one cells, so I have one division event. And what is the probability to observe M mutations in my tumor? And in the simplest case, there are only three terms. So I can have N cells in my tumor, and I have N minus one mutations, and I, I, I just get, during my cell division, I get a mutation, and that occurs with a rate mu, which is the mutation rate per cell division. I could have a division in the situation where I already have M mutations in N cells, and one of these mutated cells divides and increases its population by one without the mutation. Uh, or I have this term. No, sorry. I can have a mutation. I can have a situation where I already have M cells and the non-mutated cell divides without mu uh, mutating, and I have a situation where, like, a mutated cell already divides to increase its population by one. I don't show you the math and how to go from here to here, but you can analyze these uh, somewhat complicated differential equations, and the solution turns out to be what we call a Landau distribution. So that's a very general term of something, which is quite complicated. Uh, but there are some interesting properties. So we, for example, know uh, the scaling of this distribution. What does that mean? So the distribution looks like that. So if you have the fraction of cells here, or the frequency of mutations over my spectrum, that's how the distribution should look like. I have number of variants here, which is number of mutations, and I, I start at zero, and I get this big tail here in the end. And we know the scaling of this tail, which is one over the number of mutations squared, or if you translate it in continuous variables, it's one over the frequency squared of that, of that mutations. And we get a factor here, which is mu, what I said is this mutation rate per cell division, and beta is something like the survival rate. So this is an effective mutation rate in terms of two more doublings, for example. So how many mutations do you accumulate per two more doubling? It's not exactly the mutation rate per cell division, but something that's slightly different. And then, of course, we have, like, need to incorporate some, some real assumptions on the data, so we don't have perfect resolution. We can't find all variants in my whole tumor, so there's a detection limit. So what we expect is that we miss this part of the distribution, but we would see this part of the distribution in the data, because this is the high frequency variance and this is the low frequency variance. Yes, 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 that's the sentence here. <laughs> so of course there's assumptions, which I have mentioned before. Uh, the most important one is you assume all mutations, uh, they're mutations, but they don't change the fitness of the cells, call them neutral. So this solution is true for neutral mutations. Yeah, but, yes, yes, yes. No, but uh, if you calculate the Lua distribution, what you, what you need to do is to calculate the size distribution of these resistant populations in your bacterial population. It's very similar than calculating the size distributions of your mutations within the tumors. It's a very similar problem. You slightly change the interpretation of terms, but the problem is very similar. In terms of equations, it's exactly the same equations, actually. Uh, so the size distribution, so your bacterial population is growing. In this process of growing, you have probability of accumulating mutations. And then you calculate what is the distribution of these mutations at a certain size of your tumor, uh, of your bacterial population. That's exactly what we asked when, when, we, when, we, when we take out these tumors of patients. So this tumor has a certain size. So we condition our probability distribution on the size of the tumor, number of cells. And the tumor occurred in the process of growing and accumulating mutations. Very similar to the process of bacteria. And we don't have recombination and stuff like that. So it's a clonal population. That's why it's similar to bacteria. Yes, so importantly, so this, this solution uh, assumes uh, that, that we only have what we would call passenger mutations, actually. So having, having this hypothesis, how does the data look like? So that's a typical example. I don't show you like thousands of tumors. I just want to show you one example. So this is a gastric cancer that was sequenced to recently high, high death. And what we see is these clone mutations, which I haven't talked in this distribution before because we only look at subclone mutations. And then we see this increase of mutations to lower frequencies, which what the theory would predict should be there if we have this branching process of mutation accumulation. And then what the theory says is the slope of this, of the, of this thing should be proportional to 1 over the frequency squared. Or if we go to the cumulative distribution, so we integrate over all variants, then 
that should grow with one over the frequency. And if you plot one over the frequency over the number of mutations, that should be a straight line. And that's what we sometimes observe and sometimes not. But in some tumors, we really observe this almost perfect straight line when we look at the distribution of these subclonal mutations. Yes, yes, yes. So one of our squared is here, and this is, this is the cumulative distribution. So the previous slide was the probability distribution, and then you integrate, and then integrating over one of our squared makes one of f. Yes, yes, yes. And then, again, the slope of this, of this curve gives you this, gives you the only free parameter of this, of this model, which is this effective mutation rate. This mu divided by beta. That's the only degree of freedom you have to plot, to plot this distribution. So one important consequence of that, which I think is quite important for, for cancer, which might be trivial, but is, is still nevertheless important, is the cell similarity. So what, what the theory says is that the tumor phylogeny or heterogeneity within your tumor should be self-similar. What does that mean? If you think your whole tumor heterogeneity is this huge tree of like mutations that are everywhere, and you start to sample in certain regions of your tumor, but right, you take a sample from the left side or a sample from the right side, and you sequence it, then that means you sample from certain parts of your tree. And when it calls itself similar, that means the structure of the tree is the same everywhere. It doesn't mean that you find the same mutations everywhere because you sample sub branches of your tree. So this tree here has completely different leaves than this tree here, but the shape of the tree is the same. So the shape of this distribution or the scaling of this one over F law should be the same everywhere in the tumor. And that is also what we observe sometimes, not always, but at some of the tumors if we look at different regions of the tumor and we do this analysis, then we always find this exact scaling behavior. Sometimes we find diversions, so sometimes this is not well described by the scaling behavior, and then you need to ask, why is that the case? So what implies changes to this type of theory? And of course, the simplest question you can ask, which turns out not to be simple at all, but the most obvious question you could ask is how would it change if you have actually selection in your process? So how does it change if you have subclonal selection during this mutation of accumulations? So subclonal selection means now, so again here you have this neutral tumor, so you have like, you start with your single cell and then you have this balanced tree and you accumulate mutations. And selection means uh, at some point of this growth process in your tumor, you hit a mutation or something else, doesn't need to be a mutation, you hit something that infers a fitness advantage to cells. So they might start growing faster or die less or can be different, different mechanisms, but something that starts to increase in frequency. So we see after a while, so we need some time, we see after a while that this red clone is overrepresented in terms of its frequency. So it starts to increase in frequency. And in terms of the side frequency spectrum, what we, what we would observe, of course, this is an extreme example, but what we would expect to observe is starting to see this subclonal clusters that David, for example, also talked about, that you have these structures of subclones within your side frequency spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think we should have, yeah, yeah, you're right. So I think we should have put one of F squared here. So I think this is an, it's actually somewhat a mistake. So one over F is the cumulative distribution. One over F squared is the, is the probability distribution. You, you mean here? So if it's perfectly neutral and, and you look at this distribution, it should be one over F squared. There are reasons why, for example, in spatial growth or something, you, 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 can give, you can get variations variations of that, but here it should be one over F square. I think this is an implicit mistake because people always talk about one over F, and then I think we put, it should be one over F square. But it's also important because even if we have this, so these tails, if they're not, they not covered by this cluster, the tails are always present. So this, this, this increase in low frequency variance as a result of subclone limitations during growth should always be present, that's independent of selection. So you always, if you have high enough resolution, enough coverage, uh, enough uh, uh, cancer cell fraction, stuff like that, so you should see, if your data quality is good enough, you always should see this tail that is independent of uh, selection or not. Uh, but you might see additional things here. And then we can use this and uh, start to quantify things. We can quantify or try to quantify selection coefficients, so how strong is the selective event in this, in this tumor, and uh, when did the selective event occur in the history of the tumor. And the way to do it is we make use of two informations. 
One is the position of the peak, so what is the frequency of that, of the subclonal cluster, and what is the height of that subclonal cluster. So the height is somewhat the number of mutations you have there, and that corresponds to the age of the tumor when it, when, it, when it occurred, because we have a certain number of mutations accumulating. And when we know the age of the tumor, which of course is average with some error, but if we know the age of the tumor, and then we know the frequency of the tumor relative to the background uh, non selected cells, if you want, of the tumor, uh, we can work out what the selective coefficient should be to write, rise, rise to this frequency in that amount of time. The way to do it is like the summary of that is this type of equations. Uh, which I don't need to explain in detail, but here S is the selective coefficient of the selected variant. And here we have like the frequency of that change over time. So Tn is the time at when we diagnose the tumor and T1 is the time when, when the selective advantage occurred. And then we only see an increase in frequency here because this is a number larger than one across faster than the background cells uh, normalized by the total amount of cells that are there. And we can solve for this selective coefficient. And first thing we can do is, of course, we can uh, look at some simulations of data. So we can simulate a stochastically growing tumor, uh, uh, accumulating mutations over time, and see how the size frequency spectrum of that mutated tumor would look like under different scenarios. Sorry? So T end is the time of diagnosis. So you can translate it in a certain size, like 10 to the 10 cells, or 10 to the 11 cells. And T1 is the time at which this selected uh, event occurred. So at some point in the past of the tumor. Again, a certain size, you can say 10 to the five cells or 10 to the six cells. At some older time in the hit past of the tumor, you had the selective event. Then you need a certain time for the selective event, that event to change the frequency of that subpopulation that, that you selected for. So say again, sorry, it's a bit hard to understand. Uh, no, not necessarily, I mean, I guess you could do it, but it's, it's not, it's just, um, you really, you write down a very simple mathematical model of like the change of the frequency over time, and then the simple thing you do is you solve this equation for S, that's it. So here, you see S is here and here. You solve this equation for S, and what comes out is this equation. So sorry, if you are so late in the second equation, logarithm of F sub divided by one minus F sub, you have a, a regression in, in, the, in the left part. Yes, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you can see it as an regression. I wouldn't interpret it as a regression. It's just a result of like change in the equation for S, basically. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing magic to it. There's just, just some simple math that is underlying this thing. We don't do a lot of regression on the data. I show you like one slide later what we do because there's some stochasticity involved and describing the stochasticity analytically in terms of math, in terms of selection is extremely hard. So what we do is we go back to simulations and do some ABC, ABC yeah. To what? No, 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 we don't. <laughs> I mean, we know because we put it in, but to infer the parameters back, we don't. No, we infer. So, yes, we only infer S, uh, we, but, so, T, T is an estimate by the number of mutations in the clonal cluster, so you can calculate backwards, uh, but you see, so, sorry, you see it here, uh, it's a bit, it's not very clear, I think. So this is, so we do, so we have these three scenarios, so this is a neutral tumor where we just, there's no selective advantage at all, so you again see your clonal cluster and you see your subclonal cluster, that's what I described before. Uh, that's a situation where we introduce one selected adv advantage at some point of the tumor's history, and what you see is subclonal cluster like this tail, one subclonal cluster here, and then the clonal cluster here. And this thing has like two events of selection within the history of the tumor. So you see still your tail here, and you see two subclonal clusters occurring. And what we do here is this is this inference what, what we do using ABC. So we simulate millions of tumors with same parameters, but st st stochastically. So, so there's, there's noise and tumor scoring, you accumulate mutations, and we put in some selected advantage at some point of the tumor's history. And we use this data to infer backwards uh, 
based on these equations what 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 the numbers of, of these parameters should be. And and you can see it here. So what we infer is the S and the time basically. And then we can draw we can draw to real data again and see how it looks like in real data. And there are, now there are not there are not too many examples, so this is just some some particularly chosen examples from literature basically where we had the data that had high high enough quality to actually do this type of analysis, like deep coverage uh, of, of, of all the of all the uh, of this tumor, and where we actually see some selected events because in many tumors uh, we don't see any of these subclonal structures if we look at deep blood regions we always see this neutral type but here are some some examples that really nicely show these these, these clusters occurring and then when we when we infer the selective advantage and we infer the time of when that when that occurred what we see is which maybe is not very surprising that. If we can infer selection, then selection was very strong and occurred quite early in the history of the tumor. So the selective coefficients here you can see are 20, 30, 40 percent compared to the original tumor population. So if you, if you, if you, if you think in terms of like proliferation rates, they proliferate 20, 30 percent faster than the original tumor population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, one of the one of yeah, yeah. that's a good question. One one of the reviewers asked that, so that's it's a very important question. So what so what Ivana's work does is um, they have a different way of inferring the things. I don't want to explain exactly how they do it, but they need to assume a mutation rate, and the mutation rate they plug into this PNS paper. If you read it, is 10 to the minus 10 per base per per cell division. It's very low. It's, I would say nowadays we would think it's below germline mutation rates. So here we don't need to plug in the mutation rate. We infer it independently from, from the subclonal tail. In our case, these mutation rates are much higher. I mean, it's this effective mutation rate, but still much higher. It's in the order of 10 to the minus 8, two magnitudes of order higher. If we take the original work of Ivana and plug in these higher mutation rates, we, we actually end up in quite similar ranges of selection coefficients. So I think. So it's interesting because it's two completely different perspectives. But at the time, I think they, it's not too long ago, but I think they, they really just assumed this very low mutation rate and then that's one of the main reasons too. Yes. And then what we, what, 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 what we also can do, but this is more like a theoretical concept, is because we have this dynamic parameters, we have uh, the selective coefficient, we have the time when it occurs, so we can actually start to make uh, predictions or forecasting of like if we find subclones, what would we expect the subclone or the proportion of the subclone to look in the future? So we can we can we can simulate uh, and we can then we can infer these parameters and then we can extrapolate how the subclone would change in future. So does it take over the population or does it take over to a certain to a certain fraction and so on? And this is like so this is simulated and this is what we would predict on this AML sample where we find these two subclones. Given, given the parameters that we infer, we would, we would predict that one of these clusters vanishes in time, so it's outcompeted by the other one, whereas the other one takes over the population relatively fast within like five, six generations of tumor doublings actually, so relatively fast evolution. Unfortunately, we can't directly test that in the moment because we don't really have the data to follow up to see if this is really true or not. But it would be very interesting to do in the future to have this time progression data, which of course is very difficult to get in cancer. If I have enough time, uh, one thing I also wanted to talk about is, uh, we talked about selection, which maybe is the most important force in cancer, but the other ones, mutation and cell proliferation are very, very interesting as well. Uh, how much time do I have? Oh yeah, it's fine, thanks. Uh, and so can we, so if we go to the level of a single patient, so a patient comes to the clinic, they take out the tumor, they put the tumor on your desk, can you say what is the cell survival rate, what is the mutation rate within this tumor? A mutation rate, I don't mean burden, I mean really like mutation rate per cell division. So when a cell divides, how many mutations does it accumulate in this tumor? If they put a second tumor on your desk, can you say that for the second tumor? Is there a way to inferring that? Why are we interested in that? Because mutation rates per cell division are somewhat analogous to like generations and population evolution, for example. So a cell division is like a generation for a cell. So we want to have this information to better understand and forecast cancer evolution. And in the moment we don't have it, we may have some 
population averages, we say, ah, oh, yeah, mutation rates are roughly in the order of 10 to the minus 9 or 10 to the minus 8 per cell division, but we don't really know, and we don't know what is the variation between single patients. What's the difference? Also, what's the cell survival rate? So how many cells die per generation of tumor evolution? We don't know in the moment. Are there big differences between patients? It's always the same, we don't know. So how could we do that? Uh, I told you before, we have this line here, and the slope of this line is this mu, which actually is the mutation rate per cell division, and we have this beta, which is the survival rate. So the question simply is, can we disentangle them? Can we measure them independently? Seems to be a simple question, but the answer turns out to be difficult. From, from this line, we can't. There's no way to do it from this line, because it's just a single number, and it can be any ratio. So we have to change our strategy slightly. We have to take it from a different perspective. And I think the way to do it is to look at multi-region sampling of your tumor. Why? So, my, so before we talked about the single bulk sample here, so you take out one sample and you analyze it. Now we take out many samples of the tumor. And each of these samples, actually if you, if you, if you look at the mutations, you have these subclonal mutations, you have these clonal mutations. And now we are interested in these clonal mutations of these samples. Why? Because these clonal mutations correspond, obviously, to the most recent common ancestor of this bulk sample. So all the cells in this bulk sample came from this most recent common ancestor cell. So in a sense, uh, this bulk sequencing is also single cell sequencing, but you sequence a single cell that existed in the past of the tumor. And if you take many, many of these samples, you start to construct the genome of many, many of these single cells that ex existed in the past of the tumor. And then, if you go even further, if you, if, you, if you compare two of these single cells, again, they will share some of these mutations, some of them will be unique to these, to these single cells, so you, you again have a most recent common ancestor that gave rise to these two cells and so on, so you go further and further into the past of the tumor. This is like phylogenetics, of course, uh, but a slightly different perspective because we, all, we are interested in these differences in these mutations. So why we are interested in the difference of these mutations? So if you, now not have this tree, but you think about the single cells that existed at some point in the past of the tumor. And you accumulate mutations in this direction. So this cell carries less mutations than this cell, less mutations than this cell. And the way to solve this problem, the idea is surprisingly simple. Uh, because you talk about single cells, so go from here to here, what you have is a certain number of divisions. So you go forward in time, which means your cell divides. And in this time of divisions, you accumulate mutations. So each branch length here is the product of number of divisions times the mutation rate you have per cell division. Unfortunately, of course, both of these numbers are unknown. We don't know the number of divisions. Neither do we know the number of mutations. So these are the two unknowns of this, of this process. But if we have enough samples, what we can do is we can, we can collect all these distances on, between all the most recent common ancestor cells. And we, got a lot of, we get a lot of these distances and we know each of these distances must be a product of the number of divisions between these two cells and the number of mutations. And it turns out that if you, if you do the math and the statistics, these two informations, given enough samples, is enough to disentangle them because they follow different dis probability distributions. In terms of math, like these two random variables, the number of divisions and number of mutations, uh, you can describe it as a random sum of random variables, which you can solve, becomes this distribution. Uh, again, you have your beta here, which is the cell survival rate, and you have your mu here, which is the number of cell divisions, uh, sorry, which is the mutation rate per cell division, and you already can see in this equation that these uh, properties disentangle, so there's a chance to <laughs> sorry, I didn't, I, yeah, I, this is to, to calculate this is quite long, so I didn't want to. So YR is, um, uh, as is a certain number of mutations you have, like how long is this distance, like 10 mutations, 20 mutations, 30 mutations, and YR is the probability to observe that under certain conditions. Uh, don't want to go into all the details, it's a bit, a bit complicated. Uh, I think it's more instructive to look, to see how this distribution actually looks like. So this is how the distribution looks like if you have mutational distance here. So mutational distance is this distance between these this cells. It can be 10 mutations, 20 mutations, 12 mutations, whatever. And you see this probability of observing that uh, if you take all these distances, you get a distribution. In the nicest cases, if I chose my parameters nicely, looks like this. So you see this peaks and you see this decline towards higher distances. And here, 
that's the nicest thing. Uh, if the distribution really would look like this, you don't even know, don't need to do statistics on that. You can basically count out what is the probability of cell divisions or the number of mutations per cell divisions within this population, uh, within this distribution. So I told you that like, you can calculate that is this really true, so what, how does it look like? Again, we can, we can simulate this process, so we simulate a growing tumor accumulating mutations, and in this case, before we always simulated well-mixed populations, I really didn't talk about that, we didn't consider space. But in this case, we actually need to consider space because what we really need to do is picking most recent common ancestors that, that are distinct. And space uh, in my tumor makes sure that I pick the most recent common ancestors that are distinct enough in time to, to make this inference. If I have a well-mixed population, I always pick the same most recent common ancestors that are very close to each other and then it doesn't really work. But space uh, makes, uh, makes sure that it works. And this is like a nice possible example where we take a lot of samples from a single tumor and we reconstruct our distribution and you see the points here is what we, what we get from the tumor and the line is what the theory under these parameters that we simulated would predict. And then, again, we can do the inverse problem. Uh, we want to infer backwards the parameters that we plugged into our distribution, uh, which means uh, the cell survival rate and the mutation rate. And we see if we have simulated data, it works very well. We really can infer backwards what was the mutation rate per cell division and what is the survival rate of these cells in this tumor. Uh, doing that by MCMC, for example, we do some, some random fitting of, the, of this. Good question. Uh, so this is, this is of course the best possible scenario. So here we took a lot. We took a hundred samples of a tumor. It's of course unrealistic. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Good question. I, I will come to that. Uh, first one, I, I will answer, I want, first one to answer your question. So this is like a hundred samples on a single tumor, which of course we don't have in the moment. Uh, inference here is done with only ten samples on the tumor. And we compare all pairwise distances be between all most recent common ancestors because of combinatorics that actually gives you quite a lot of, quite a lot of distances already to the inference. If you go below, there's no clear threshold, but if you go below eight or seven, you just get noise, basically you don't see anything anymore. So you need, you need to have a certain amount of samples per tumor. The more the better, but it seems in real data you also saturate at some point, you don't gain more information if you add more and more samples, that also becomes a problem. But that might just be a sampling problem because the samples we get in the clinic tend to be very close to each other in space. If you would get the whole chunk of the tumor and you can sample from many, many different sites, it might improve actually. But this data we don't have in the moment. Uh, but we have, we have some real data here. So this is three examples, uh, three patients. And this is multivision sample colon cancer and we had 10 samples per patient. And you see here, this is, uh, the dots are again this distribution we would construct and the black line is, is uh, the distribution we infer. And now you don't see this very nice oscillations, but this is just because of the combination of parameters. So if you see or don't see oscillations, that depends on the ratio of the mu and the beta, so that changes the shape of the distribution a bit. But uh, you can exactly do the same inference that we did before, and to get some sanity check to see that we don't infer some random noise, you can infer all these parameters separately for every chromosome of your tumor, for example. We would assume certain parameters like cell survival rate should be fairly constant. I mean, there's no reason why one chromosome dies more than the other chromosome in, in a tumor, so that should be always the same number. And here we infer uh, the mutation rate per cell division. And what we find are quite interesting differences between tumors. So we find differences in mutation rates per cell division. So roughly they're in the order of 10 to the minus, 10, 10 to the minus 8 mutations per base per, per division which means if you, if you scale it to the whole genome, it's like roughly 10 mutations per cell division on the scale of the whole genome, roughly. So there's like a factor of two or three different between different, different patients. But we see quite some differences between the beta. So beta 0.52 and 0.34 doesn't seem to be much of a difference, but it, it tells you how fast your tumor is growing. So beta equals one, one, one second, beta equals, equals one is a very fast growing tumor, basically no cell death, and beta low is a very slow growing tumor. It does. I don't. Sh I don't show it here, but uh, it looks. It looks quite, quite reasonable. I mean, you see that if you divide by beta, you don't. I mean, the betas are not like 
point zero 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 one, so you don't jump orders of magnitude. You, you stay in the order of t 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 7. That's also what we found before in this one of our study, but we couldn't disentangle them. Yes. Yes. It's a very good question also. Uh, yes. So it is based on the assumption that there are a few cell divisions, but few means between most recent German ancestors, uh, maybe five or six generations, maybe ten generations, it still works. If you have like a hundred generations between each of these ancestral cells, it wouldn't work. Luckily, what you do is like you can you can uh, do some simple coalescence theory, which I haven't, haven't, haven't done here, but uh, if you have an exponentially growing population and you do this inference and you have a bulge of a certain size, like a million cells, for example, uh, that million cells also already cut, uh, brings you back quite far in the past of the tumor. So your most recent common ancestor is actually relatively early in tumor evolution already. So then if you, if you compare ancestral cells, you go further and further back into the evolution of the tumor. So what we, what we see here is these numbers are still in the beginning of tumor evolution. It's not, it's not mutations in the very end of tumor evolution because you jump basically to the beginning of your, of your, of your, of your tumor. And then, so that, that's maybe a, a problem, but it also helps because if you're early on, it makes sure that you have few cell divisions between, between, and we talk about generations, and if you have five, six generations between each of these ancestral cells, if you add up to 20, 30, 40, 50 generations in total as a sum, subdivided in this, in this most recent ancestral cells, is actually your tumor population without cell death would be huge, like you would have a huge tumor. Of course, you have cell death, so uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not that big, but uh, you cover quite a bit, but you subdivide it in, in, in populations. But yeah, that's a very important question that, yes. Uh, last slide, so what we then can do, so we, I only showed you three examples. Uh, we can, we can then do inferences on other tumor types where we have the data. Unfortunately, we need like uh, good enough quality and enough multi-region samples on that single tumor. So there's not enough, like there's not a lot of data out there where we can do it, but in the moment we have 13 tumors where we can do the inference and we, we see interesting patterns. If we, if, we, if we plot the mutation rate here and cell survival rate here, you see, in general you see a linear correlation, but then there are some outliers here which are some MSI positive tumors. Uh, and you see some outliers here which are tumors that seem to have like normal mutation rates in a sense of like still healthy mutation rates if you believe that 10 to the minus 9 is a healthy mutation rate but change the beta quite a bit so sometimes tumors still might maintain their repair mechanisms but then just just grow and funny enough for example this dot here is an adenoma and the adenoma is closest to what we think healthy tissue would look like so low mutation rate not much of like a fitness advantage compared to healthy tissue slightly but not not a lot and we can infer ages so how old is your tumor starting from the most recent common ancestor that we can then de de detect? So we don't talk about development, but like how long did it take the tumor to grow to this, to this size? And we, we see clustering here. So many, many of the tumors, they're one, two, three years old. But then there are some that are very old. They're 20, to 20 years or 10 years, which surprisingly are some of the MSI tumors. So some of the MSI tumors seem to grow very slowly. It takes them a very long time to, to reach this size. Okay, so thank you very much. And we can take one really burning question, and that's David. So that's going to be only you asking that question. Okay. <laughs> um, so. I, I had two questions, but if I'm only allowed one, um, <laughs> um, I. Uh, can, can I ask about uh, copy number? So, so as, I, as I showed in, in, in my talk, it's, it's essential to, to take account of copy number and purity yep. um, in, in, in uh, evaluating the, these allele frequencies. So, so in particular, if so, so the, the TCGA samples, I think, typically have purity of around 50%. Um, so, so clonal mutations, you'd expect to be at 25% yep. in a diploid tumour. 
Um, I, th I, th I think you look at the allele frequencies between 10 and 10 and 25 percent. So, so those will actually be the, the downside of the clonal cluster. Um, but it's further affected by by copy number. If you've got you know tetraploid tumours or copy number changes, they'll also you know uh, greatly affect. Uh, the the the, um, the the distribution of the allele frequencies. Uh, the the other question, which which I, I'm not allowed to ask, was was but was back to go back to what Quaid was saying um, earlier that we um, that the, the the smooth one over f or one over f squared distribution you'd expect for for large population sizes, but actually doesn't apply um, at the earlier stages of of tumor growth because it's you know, it's basically stochastic, um, and in order to get that to observe high mutation rates that are observed in, in your tumors, you actually need to have a very high rate of cell death, um, which, which introduces a lot, of, a lot of stochasticity, and so you don't actually get smooth distribution um, from those tumors. You don't have to answer the second one. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, wait, wait, wait. So first question, yes, that's very important. Uh, Copy numbers are very important if you, if, if you want to do these things. I mean, for these things, usually what we do is we just look at the deployed part of the genome. So we do the inference, so we, we filter for deployed. Which for, if you, if you want to, if you just want to look at select, if you don't want to infer driver mutations and stuff like that, it's, 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 it's fine because uh, your evolution is clonal. So uh, all the effects, if it's, let's say, chromosome 13, uh, sweeps through the whole population of the tumor. You don't actually need to look at chromosome 13 if you look at single populations. If you look at the population level, of course, that's completely different. Uh, so you can filter for that. Uh, purity is a huge issue. Uh, and, and that is like, goes hand in hand with sequencing death. So you need to have a good enough combination of death plus purity to actually see these uh, clonal tails, uh, subclonal tails, sorry. Uh, if, if your coverage is not high enough and you have very low purity, you simply don't see them because your resolution is just too poor. And then there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, that's that's just how it is. Uh, no, so, so we we look for selective advantages within the single cell population, and it's a slightly different question. We don't. We don't, we don't want to infer driver mutations or subclone populations. We look, is there a selection or not? And selection, if you look in single populations, doesn't care where in the genome it occurs. Uh, your whole genome is in linkage. So, your whole, so if there's a selective event, the selection doesn't even need to be mutations or copy numbers. It can be microenvironment, it can be immune system, it can be other things, space, for example, like if you have spatial constraints and suddenly, suddenly you don't grow exponentially anymore, but you grow on the outskirts of your tumor, but not in the inside, so you have a selective advantage outside, for example. Uh, all of these things are somewhat reflected in the distribution. How strong they are reflected and like how strong these effects are, that's also a difficult question. I mean, that's a very important question as well. Uh, but it's, it doesn't matter which, if your genome is large enough that you look at, I mean, obviously if you look at a single base pair and you want to see evolution, you don't see anything because nothing changes. But if your genome is, ha is large enough, let's say, you look at half of your genome or one quarter of your genome and you, you do these inferences, that's fine because everything that occurs somewhere is swept through your population. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay, I, I suggest you're gonna continue that very, very interesting discussion in Rimini. <laughs> and we're gonna move to another speaker.